great to see you here this morning. Um, also, shout out to you joining us online. I guess we had a glitch again this week. And so we're live streaming this service. So welcome uh, to Grace Point. I'm glad you're joining us online today. Do you know your fit when it comes to the things of God? Do you know your place where you fit into his plans? A big question that we human beings tend to have Whatever we're participating in is, how do I fit? Where's my place? So that's true whether it's your family or a work environment or a college situation. Frequently, the question is percolating someplace in your mind. How do I fit into this place? What's my part? One of the disruptive things about COVID-19 has been that it's taken all that away from us. Things where we kind of had some assurance, like this is how I do this, this is where I fit, have been taken away. And we're trying to figure out how do I do family again? How do I work? How do I have any kind of recreational life? Can I do anything social anymore? Um, And all those things that maybe we once had established uh, have been kind of torn down and we're rethinking, how do I find my place? This is a common question that we humans have. How do I find my place? We're on a study here from the book of Galatians. And we're going to get to chapter 2 today. And a big theme of Galatians chapter 2 is how we find our place in God, where we find our fit. And so today's message, I think, will really be relevant to us and will answer some of those bigger questions and then help us answer some of the more uh, pressing questions like how do I find my place and my fit when it comes to something like COVID-19. So we're going to begin by reading verses 1 through 5 of chapter 2 of Galatians. And I want to give you a little bit of a a background so you know what's happening here. Uh, The Apostle Paul was converted to Christianity, and he didn't go back to Jerusalem after that. He instead went to various regions of the Gentiles and ministered to them. So now with that bit of background, we pick up chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. Then after 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas. I took Titus along also. I went in response to a revelation and, meeting privately with those esteemed as leaders, I presented to them the gospel that I preached among the Gentiles. I wanted to be sure I was not running and had not been running my race in vain. Yet not even Titus, who was with me, was compelled to be circumcised, even though he was a Greek. This matter arose because some false believers had infiltrated our ranks to spy on the freedom we have in Christ Jesus and to make us slaves. We did not give in to them for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. So what we're going to see here in the book of Galatians chapter 2 is that Paul is going to reveal in this chapter truth after truth after truth of what it means to find your place in God. Find your way in God. And here's a summary of the first point from the scripture I just read. Jesus sets you free from attempting to come to and please God through following rules. He just sets you free from that. It's not how you come to God. You don't come to God by following rules. Paul notes that Titus, who's a Greek, was not forced by the religious leadership of that time to be circumcised. I'm sure Titus went, whoo, right, amen? All you men should go, amen, amen? I don't care if you women participate. You don't have any understanding, but you men should be going, amen, amen. It's a good thing. Here's the problem behind the situation. Rules try to fix frequently an internal problem by external control, and that just doesn't work. It just doesn't work. And Jesus rebuked the religious leadership of his day for frequently being dogmatic in their minutia, law-giving and law uh, observance, and yet being rotten on the inside. He called them whitewashed sepulchers. What he was saying was, you look really good on the outside, and you look nice and clean, but when we bite into your life, you're rotten to the core. I love what uh, Pastor Sean did a few years ago in youth, or a couple years ago. He haven't been doing it that long. So uh, he, he, he did this demonstration for the youth, and I'm going to shamelessly use it this morning. And what he did was he made some caramel apples. I got the story straight because I just talked to him this morning, and then he made a couple caramel onions that looked just like an apple. 
And so he handed these out to the youth, right? And of course, if you got the one with an apple and bit into it, it was juicy and great on the outside and juicy and great on the inside, amen? But then if you got the one with the onion, you took a bite into it and what? It wasn't what you expected. It was terrible. Now, these analogies, I'm going to be, I'm with Sean on these. Sean's sitting over here. That's why I'm looking at him. These analogies are great until you always get that one uncooperative youth. And Avery Minor, I don't know where you are. There you are. You're that person. There's the man. He, he bit into the onion that was coated with caramel. And he said, this is pretty good. And he ate the whole thing. Didn't you, Avery? He's up there. Raise your hand, Avery. There, there he is. And he wrecked the whole illustration for Pastor Sean. Shame on you. <laughs> he put a lot of thought into that, you know, making it an impactful moment. And the youth are going, oh, I guess caramel onions aren't all that bad. <laughs> so I have a caramel apple here today in memory of what Sean did that's really good. And I want to give this away to somebody. Does anybody want it? Is there any kids? They're not going to look at me. Look at Jenna. She's, I'm not going to look at him. I'm not, not going to look at him. I'm not going to look at him. She's not going to have eye contact. Does anybody want this caramel apple? Because if you get it, you have just, all you have to do is take a bite. Somebody is going to say, come on up, sweetie. Oh, of course. Kirby's daughter. <laughs> Here, this is yours. You just have to take a bite. It's dripping, but it's just... Oh, look at her. It's good, isn't it? Because I'm not like Pastor Sean. I'm a nice guy. I gave you an apple. Yay, you can have that. Go home and eat it to your heart's delight. I was going to say that was made under very sanitary conditions. Vicki and I made sure that we didn't touch anything, wash our hands multiple times. Just this the era we live in. Um, and, and what Jesus was saying was this leadership that was into this minutia kind of rulemaking and dogmatic, you know, rule adherence, they look like a caramel apple on the outside. They were just really sweet. But on the inside, when you bit into them, you were really biting into onion. It was sour. It wasn't something that was all that good. And, uh, and, and he called them whitewashed sepulchers. And, and Paul had been preaching this message that it's all about the heart. It's all about the heart. And he was finding assurance when he went to the leadership in Jerusalem that he had been preaching right. And so this brings us to this sub point here. You find your place as you welcome and embrace the inner transformation work of the Holy Spirit. That's what the Apostle Paul had been saying. It's about an inner heart change. It's not about, you know, dietary laws or Sabbath keeping or, uh, you know, circumcision. And the leadership affirmed that in him. External controls, external procedures, friends, they never change a heart. Amen? What changes your heart is coming to Christ in faith and then having the Holy Spirit come in you and change you from the inside out so that when I bite into your life, I don't bite into onion, I bite into apple. Amen? And I experience the sweetness of the Spirit. So how are you doing inside today? Are you doing good inside? Would you say, all's well with my soul? You watching online, would you say, I'm doing great. I'm loving this new paradigm we find ourselves in. This new COVID-19 that's always kind of rattling around in the background. Are you experiencing the freedom that Paul talked about here of knowing I've come to Jesus and I'm a beloved son or daughter of the living God and it's not by keeping rules that I please God, but because I, 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 I love Jesus, now I want to please him. It's an outcome of being right with Jesus. See, rules don't make you right. You're right when you come to God by Jesus. And once you're right in Jesus, you want to live right. Amen? And Paul had this order down right, and he wants us to have it down. These false teachers that were showing up and saying you have to follow some rules, they were enslaving the people or attempting to enslave the people again. And Paul says, we're not going to give in to them for a moment. We're not going to be enslaved by rules that don't change a heart. Instead, we're going to be captivated by Jesus Christ. He changes your heart. Amen changes your heart. Now we get to verse 6 of Galatians 2. It's a pivotal verse of, of, the, of this chapter. I love this verse. And I've given it to you in two versions today. Uh, it's basically an updated version of the NIV. So I'm going to talk to you about it uh, using 1984 NIV and then using 2011 NIV, New International Version of, of the Bible, because I love the way these two versions state uh, a key sentence in this verse differently. So here we go. 1984 NIV, New International Version of Galatians uh, chapter 2, verse 6. As for those who seem to be important, whatever they were makes no difference to me. Listen to this. 
God does not judge by external appearance. Amen? Amen. These men added nothing to my message. Now let's go to the 2011 version of the New International. And, and here's what it says. As for those who are held in high esteem, basically the same thing, whatever they were makes no difference to me. Now listen to this. God does not show favoritism. They added nothing to my message. This is good stuff, isn't it? This is life-giving information. It's just so great. It's absolutely essential for you and I to be convictional uh, on what this verse says. So here's point two of, of, of how to find your place, how to find your right place in God. God does not judge by the external. He shows no partiality. I remember vaguely my high school days. I mean, that's a long time ago for me. But one of the things I did not like about high school was this attempt by so many of the students to create this pecking order kind of thing. You know what I mean, right? I didn't have the time of day for that when I was in it, and I don't have the time of day for that now. And it reminds me of what happens with a herd of horses. Any of you have horses? Uh, some of you do here, okay. This would work really well if I was West River, but just imagine with me, okay? If you ever heard of horses, there's always one horse that's the dominant horse. And there's always one horse that's dominated by all the other horses, and then everyone else finds their place somewhere in between. And that poor dominated horse, whenever you feed them, if you feed them together, especially in the wintertime when they're a bit hungry, that poor horse will be bitten and kicked and pushed out of the way, and it will get the scraps uh, left over. In fact, sometimes you have, to, you have to separate it out and feed it individually so that it gets fed, because the other horses will basically bully it and push it out of the way to the point where it actually harms this horse. If you ever want to do something interesting with your kids and teach them some, some basic things about animals, it, take them to somebody who has five or six horses and watch them feed the horses. One will dominate, one will be dominated, and every other one will find their place in between. Oftentimes we act like animals are these great beings and love each other and we put human traits on them and they're not like that. They're beastly, amen. They honestly don't care for each other. Are you okay with me saying that? And this is a good optic lesson for your kids to say, aren't you grateful that when it comes to God, there's not a dominance thing, there's not a pecking order. God shows no partiality. He shows no favoritism. Aren't you grateful for that? What a good lesson to teach your kids. They need to hear that from you because life will be like that for them. And they need to know that in God, there is no partiality. He shows no favoritism. That's such good news. In fact, it's such good news that Paul returns to this thought a few times in the book of Galatians. One such case is chapter 3, verse um, 28, which we'll get to next week. But Paul states here, we're all sons and daughters of the living Jesus Christ. He said, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave or free, male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Amen? There you go. You're sleeping on me. Amen? Amen. We're all one in Christ Jesus. And I declare to you today that we're one. There, there is no difference in God's sight because we're one race or another race. Amen. That's a hot topic right now. And the Bible clearly says what's up there. There is no distinction based on your ethnicity. Amen. Amen. There's no distinction based on your economic well-being. There's no distinction based on your social status. We are all one in Jesus Christ. I rejoice in that. I revel in that. I find delight in that. It blesses my soul. How about you? Because quite frankly, I don't have the time of day for that nonsense. And I love it when the Bible says it so clearly that it's not like that in God's sight. Let me give you a story that maybe emphasizes what it's really like. Because really what Jesus is like is that he sees the rejected and the despised and the abused ones of the culture and he relates so readily to them. Listen to this story. Bob Weber, past president of the Kiwanis International, told the story. He had spoken to a club in a small town and was spending the night with a farmer on the outskirts of the community. He had just relaxed on the front porch when a newsboy uh, delivered the evening paper. The boy noted the sign, puppies for sale. The boy got off his bike and said to the farmer, now, how much do you want for one of those puppies? To which the farmer replied, $25, son. Bob Weber said the boy's face just physically dropped. You could tell he didn't have the money. He said, could I see them anyway? 
and the farmer whistled, and around the corner of the house comes the mom, and along comes then behind her four of the cutest puppies you've ever seen in your life. And then a little bit later, a fifth one comes, and he's kind of straggling along, dragging his hind leg. What's the matter with that last puppy, the little boy asked. Well, son, that puppy is crippled. We took her to the vet, took an x-ray of her hip, and she has no hip joint, just doesn't have a hip joint. So she's always going to be crippled. She's always going to drag that leg. To the amazement of both Weber and the farmer, the little boy got very animated. And he said, I have got to own that puppy. Mister, I'll buy that puppy from you. I'll pay you 50 cents a week until I pay off the $25, but I have to have that puppy. And the farmer replied, son, don't you understand? That puppy's always going to be a cripple. It's always going to drag that leg. It's not going to be anything you want. It's just a useless pup. And the boy paused for a moment, and then he pulled up his leg. And I remember this because I had some friends that had this happen to them. He pulled up his leg to reveal this brace, leather strap above the knee, leather strap at the ankle, and a twisted leg. And that, that metal brace was holding his leg straight. And he said to this farmer, he said, Mister, that puppy's gonna need somebody that relates to him in life. And I'm that person. Listen, that's Jesus. Jesus sees our limps. He sees our deficiencies, he sees our bruises, he sees our injuries, he sees our scars, and he relates to those things. He empathizes with us. There is no favoritism in him. There is no partiality in him. He doesn't judge by external appearances. He doesn't just go after the beautiful people, the, 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 the gorgeous people, the people who have their act together, the people who are smart, and the people who are at the top of the class. Our Jesus loves people. And the ones he seems to love the most are the ones who are authentically coming to him that are kind of messed up, amen? That's who he loves. I found it timely that as I was preparing this message, my son Nate sent me a video of his two boys. And they are different as night and day. You've got James, who's 10, and you've got Sam, who's 7. And Nate, like any good parent and, and, and former you know, basketball player and all that kind of stuff, he had set up a little basketball drill for his boys to practice. He had three X's, and they were supposed to dribble from X to X to X, you know, and working on, on their dribbling skills. What I found fascinating was how different Nate and James are. Okay, James... He's got his outfit on. He's looking good. Great looking t-shirt, shorts that match, socks and shoes. And he's doing the drill in compliance with his papa. You could see him just working hard, thinking hard, doing the drill right. I thought, that's James. In fact, when I was at the cabin here recently, James came up from sleeping with a robe on. And he looked just dapper. He's got this nice jammers on and a robe. And I said, well, where's your pipe? We're right over his head. But I thought, he just, that's just James. He just looked like, wow, you look like an old soul in a young body. What's going on here? Then you have Sam. So then the video goes to Sam next. No shirt. Baggy shorts that go to his knees. Of course, no socks. One shoe maybe was half on, half I don't know. That's Sam. And he's dribbling, and he thinks, it's just easier to leave the ball here and go to touch this thing here. And then, and then I hear James, or uh, Nate go, Sam? You have to dribble while you touch the X's. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and that is just Sam. Wearing a shirt is an unnecessary accessory. Why would you wear a shirt? Nobody wears shirts, right? Amen? And this boy won't have a shirt on in the middle of the wintertime. It, it's just like, why do that? It's just a waste of time. He's barefoot. He, he has calluses on his feet that are amazing. You can see them when he swims because they look grossly white. You know, he said, what's wrong with his feet? Nate goes, those are calluses because he never wears shoes. And this dynamic here, these two boys, remind me of this, this scripture. God shows no partiality. You know, God loves James and Sam equally. It doesn't matter that they're so unique and so different. That's our God, amen? Do you understand? If you're gonna find your place in God, you have got to know that it's not about external experience, uh, you know, appearances. It's not about your performance. He loves you because of who you are and because of who he is. Amen? And that's simply that. Let's go to Galatians 2, and I'm going to continue now and read on, and we're going to find that the other way we find our place is by understanding that God has a ministry for us. Listen to Galatians 2, verses 7 through 10. On the contrary, they recognized that I had been entrusted uh, with the task of preaching the gospel to the uncircumcised. 
just as Peter had been to the circumcised. For God, who was at work in Peter as an apostle to the circumcised, was also at work in me as an apostle to the Gentiles. James, Cephas, and John, those esteemed as pillars, gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship when they recognized the grace given to me. They agreed that we should go to the Gentiles and they to the circumcised. All they asked was that we should continue to remember the poor, the very thing I've been eager to do all along. So God had a specific ministry for for Paul, and that was to the Gentiles. And the thing we need to understand is this, God has ministry for you and me too, as called one to Jesus Christ. If you've given your life to Jesus Christ, God has ministry for you to do. He has a, a place for you to fit in that, that regard. Uh, we talk about this all the time here at Grace Point, that we're called to be grace givers. And basically we have been graced with gifts from God as a believer so that we can bless those around us with those particular gifts. Sometimes the way God interacts with lives is through the person of the Holy Spirit. Amen, right? He just comes in the power of the Holy Spirit and he touches the situation. Sometimes, though, the way God graces a situation is he uses the body of Christ and the gifts that he's given to the body of Christ so that we can bless one another and bless those around us with the gifts of God given to us. 1 Peter 4 verse 10 says this, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. So here's point three. If you're taking notes today, here's point three of how to find your place. God has a place for you to minister using the gifts you have received. God has a place for you to minister using the gifts you have received. Let me talk to you about how this kind of works itself out using a couple sub points here. You fit someplace into the body of Christ. First of all, you got to understand you fit someplace into the body of, of Jesus Christ. He has gifted each one of us differently so that when we come together and we let the gifts of God flow from us one to another, we experience in the completeness of Jesus Christ. Let's step back a minute, though. I just got to talk to you on this, all right? So I'm kind of stepping out of this, uh, of this point, but I just want to talk to you on this. There is a natural progression to growth that we're meant to experience as a follower of God. First of all, you come to church like this, and maybe you don't know Jesus today. You're coming today as a consumer, and that's okay because you need Jesus more than anything, and you need to know he can meet your needs in your life, amen? You're coming with this kind of consumeristic bent, like what can Jesus do for me? I'm desperately in need, and that's a good starting point. And then if you receive Christ, you're born again, and the Holy Spirit fills you, and you begin this transformative process of sanctification, of becoming more and more like Jesus Christ. And when it first begins, you're just an infant. You're just learning some things. And the body of Christ should rally around you and encourage you. But we don't expect much from you at that point because you don't know much. You don't expect your two-year-old to do much. You're not going to say, hey, you know what? You just filled your diaper. Go change yourself. They, no, I'm not saying that about the body of Christ. But they can't do that. You have to do that for them. Amen? But at some point in this progression of following Jesus Christ, a light switch should go off in you and the bulb should come on and you should switch from being a consumer to being a what? C contributor, a giver. You should begin to, instead of asking, what are you going to do for me? You should begin to say, what am I called to do for others? And God wants us to grow up in our faith and move into maturity and move from being a consumer to being a contributor. Now, here's the problem. Here's the challenge. We live in a very consumeristic culture. Amen? And that consumerism is just rampant. Look what happened during COVID-19. So we shut down culture. So what do people do? They go to Amazon and buy stuff. They go to Lowe's, and they, Lowe's can't keep up with it. The, you know, the, the, whole, the whole building industry is going crazy. Their numbers are going through the roof. Why? Because people are buying stuff and doing things. Why? Because we're a consumeristic culture. And that consumerism infiltrates the church frequently into our mindset and how we view the church. And I want to tell you, it's devastatingly wrong. It just destroys the church of Jesus Christ if we come to this thing thinking it's about us and consuming. Because at some point, if you're following after Jesus' heart, it, it, it's about you contributing and using the gifts that God has given you to bless other people. Amen? 
And it's the way we grow up in our faith. And it's the way we find our place. And it's the way we begin to experience the sweet spot that God has for us. Second sub-point here is God has, a, has placed you in a unique position. He graces you with unique opportunities that nobody else has. And you have to step into that influence and, and, and use it in a, in a way that brings glory to Jesus. Let me give you an Old Testament example. In 2 Kings chapter 7, you can read about how Samaria was surrounded by the king of Aram. And Samaria was in big trouble. They were going really hungry. The people were getting really hungry. And at one point, as you read that account, you read about these four leopards who were at the city gate. Now, why were they at the city gate? Because they weren't allowed in the city proper because they had leprosy. And they were considered unclean and despised. And, and they were part of the culture, but they weren't included in the culture, okay? So they're at the city gate, and they, they said to one another, this is crazy, basically. We're dying here, and we're going to die anyway, so let's go give ourselves up to the Arameans, and hopefully they don't kill us, and they let us live. So they leave the city gate, and they go into the, camp, the encampment of the Arameans. Nobody's there. And God had caused the sound of troops to come upon the Arameans, and they had gotten afraid and fled and so the, what are the, 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 the lepers found? This whole encampment, gone, no, not a person there, and tons of food. And guess what they begin to do? They just ate and ate. That's what I would do. How about you? But then at one point, and this is kind of amazing, one of the lepers says to the others, we're not doing right. This is a day of good news, and we are keeping it to ourselves, and God will surely judge us if we do this. We need to go back and tell the royal palace that there's salvation in this camp. There's food in this camp. And so they went back to this place under siege, or thought they were under siege, and they announced there's food. And they saved, basically, Samaria. And here's what's interesting. Who were they? They were the despised, rejected outcasts of their culture who could have well thought, well, you know what? You won't even let us go into the city. We have to spend our time at the city gate. We're not even welcome among you. But no, they used their influence. They used that as an opportunity to do what? To bring good news to people who are under siege. We live in a culture under siege. People are dying and going to hell. They don't know Jesus Christ. This COVID-19 is rocking the world. They're afraid and they're fearful. And you got the news exaggerating it all the time, both directions. So if you watch it, you're just fearful and full of anxiety. Listen, you're like a leopard in this regard. You have some good news for those under siege. Amen? Use your position of influence for the glory of Jesus Christ. Just live your faith out loud and tell people, you can find food in Jesus. He can change everything. Amen? This is the second way we really begin to step into the ministry that God has graced us with if we just simply use our influence for the glory of Jesus. Let me finish reading to you now, Galatians 2. I'll pick it up at verse 11, read through verse 21, and then I'll make one big point from here and we'll be done. When Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles, but when they arrived, he began to draw back or separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged to the circumcision group. He was afraid of the Jews. The other Jews joined him in his hypocrisy so that by their hypocrisy, even Barnabas, who was called son of encouragement, was led astray. When I saw that they were not acting in line with the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in front of them all, you are a Jew, yet you live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How is it then that you force Gentiles to follow Jewish customs? We who are Jews by birth and not sinful Gentiles know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law because by the works of the law no one will be justified. But if in seeking to be justified in Christ we Jews find ourselves also among the sinners which the law will do if you really listen to the law and hear what it says you'll realize you're a sinner. Doesn't that mean that Christ promotes sin? No. Absolutely not. If I rebuild what I destroyed, then I really would be a lawbreaker. So what he's saying here, if I know that the law doesn't save me, but yet now in Christ I begin to say, no, you have to have the law save you. I'm rebuilding what was meant to be torn down, and I become a lawbreaker. 
For through the law I died to the law so that I might live for God. Now hear this verse. This is our crescendo thought to this message. Hear this verse. I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. Now there's a multiple uh, number of ways I could address this scripture with you. I'm not going to do that. I could talk about the law and all that, but that, that's a message maybe for next week in Galatians 3. I could talk about Peter's disassociation and hypocrisy of it all uh, when he disassociated with the Gentiles because some buddies showed up from a peer group of Jews that, that he felt the need to disassociate. And Paul adequately rebuked him over that. Amen? Here's what I want us to talk about because this thematically fits in with the message I'm sharing with you today, how, how to find your place in God. It's kind of a crescendo thought, and it's this. In Jesus, you no longer live, but Jesus lives in you. You want to find your place in God? You have to die. You have to diminish. And Christ has to become everything. We need to read this verse 20 out loud together. I want you to read this out loud with me, okay? And those of you joining us online right now, I want you to read it out loud with us also at home. Chances are everybody's been running around the house. We have some kids. Maybe gather them together and join us online. And we'll read this verse out loud together. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. It is a verse you should memorize. It's super important. Let's read it out loud. Here we go. I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body... I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. See, Peter was swayed by the acceptance of this peer group. It swayed him and he began to act differently. And what Paul is saying here is we, if we've been crucified with Christ, we no longer live, then whatever group we find ourselves in, it doesn't matter if they're a kindred group or a group that opposes us, we will not be swayed by them because greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. And Paul is saying, I have died, I no longer live, and Christ lives in me, amen? And then what we're drawn to is Christ and Christ alone. I'm going to end here with a, a quote from a couple of famous uh, men, John Wesley being the first one. He's the founder of our church movement that we're part of. And in the midst of the Methodist movement in the 1700s, he said this, Would to God that all party names and unscriptural phrases and forms which divide the Christian world were forgot. I should rejoice if the very name Methodist might never be mentioned more, but be buried in eternal oblivion. And what Wesley was saying was, these labels don't matter. What matters is that we follow Jesus Christ, amen? And listen, we're getting into this now. Are you a mask wearer or are you not a mask wearer? And we're labeling each other. And it's the same kind of thing. I pray that those labels go to eternal oblivion because they don't matter. What matters is what? We serve Jesus Christ. And then the great preacher Charles, Charles Spurgeon said this. Uh, he was called the Prince of the Baptist Preachers. I want to give you that background. Some of you have a, ba a Baptist background. You'll like this. He said this from the pulpit. I see of the Baptist name, let it perish. But let Christ's name last forever. I look forward with pleasure to the day when there will not be a Baptist living. Woo! I can say that with you guys because you're kind of friendly. I don't know if I'd say that in a Baptist church. Amen? But... Spurgeon can get away with that. You see what his point was though? What was his point? Everything finds its proper place when Jesus is elevated to his proper place. And so listen, you want to find your place in God? You have to die and Christ has to live in you. You have to die and Christ has to live in you. And that's where we're going to end today. Would you join me for prayer? Would you bow your heads please? Lord God, I want to thank you for Galatians 2. It's such a, a good centering chapter of the Bible on what really matters. Thank you, Jesus, that in you we have freedom. And it's not about obeying some rules. It's not about being in compliance that makes us okay. It's rather having faith in you, Jesus, and being filled with the Holy Spirit and undergoing that transformative moment, Lord, when you change us from the inside out. Thank you. 
Thank you, Jesus. It's not about rules. It's not about some kind of ritual. Thank you, Jesus. And thank you, Jesus, that you show no favoritism. You show no partiality. But in you, we're all one in Jesus Christ. There is no slave. There is no free. There is no male. There is no female. Uh, racial ethnicity isn't what distinguishes us. There is no distinguishing on social and economic kind of indices, Lord. But we're just one in Jesus Christ. Praise be to your name. That's so liberating and that's so good and that's so right. And we rejoice in that today, Lord. And thank you, as Paul says here, Lord, that we really find the sweet spot. We really find the place that we belong, Lord, when we step into the giftedness that you give us and start ministering to others. God, grace us to do that very thing. We pray this, Lord Jesus, in your name. We claim all these things, that they be reality. And may we come to that crescendo thought that Paul brings us to in our own lives, Lord, that I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. I just pray these things would resonate in our soul this week, Lord. Rattle our thinking, cause us to look at life differently, Lord. We pray these things in your name, Jesus, by your blood. And all God's people said,